Hello and welcome to a brand new series of used car heaven. Now over the next few weeks we've got a whole stack of great ideas of cars for you to buy because maybe you don't want to spend your hard-earned cash on a new car and you want to make significant savings and buy a used car instead. No matter what sort of budget you've got to spend, I'm sure we'll have the perfect car for you over the next few weeks. Here's what's coming up on this programme. We drive two small to medium sized hatchbacks, the Ford Escort and the Peugeot 306, but which is best? And our car doctor, Simon Hughes, will be in his surgery. Now Saab are well known for their fantastic build quality and overall reliability. And here we have two very fine examples. First of all, the 9000. Now this is the more executive of the two cars. When this was new, it would have cost £28,000. But now you could pick this up for as little as £9,000. Or how about a 900S Turbo? A P-Reg slightly older, again cost new £21,000 about five years ago, but now could be yours for as little as £7,000. Both of these are turbocharged as well and are pretty quick. Now, I know that a lot of people rather tend to think that Saabs are pretty ugly cars, and sure, they wouldn't get 10 out of 10 in the beauty contest stakes, but I think they're very practical. And as you can see, even the smaller of the two Saabs, the 900, this one, a five-door example, has got an enormous boot on it. I mean, there is acres of space in there. Now, the 900 comes in either three-door or five-door. The three-door is classed as a coupe and looks a little bit more sporting, but if you've got a family and you need that extra space and that extra practicality, then you ought to go for the five-door. As you can see, there's plenty of room here in the back. Three adults can sit quite comfortably back there. So maybe by this stage, I've got you thinking that perhaps a Saab 900 might be the car for you. We're talking about great build quality. We're talking about reasonable prices for what is a car with that all important status symbol badge on the front of it. Saab say that they never do anything that's conventional. I suppose you can see that in the design of their cars. I think that the 900 is a very good car, so much so that I actually bought one. This is our family car, not this particular car, but one almost identical to it. It's a 900 three-door coupe, it's a base model, and that's perhaps one thing that I would shy away from doing again, buying a base model, because it's not got a sunroof and it's not got air conditioning on, which on a day like this, you kind of really need. Now this five year old car has done, well it's done quite a high mileage, 95,000 miles, but it's got a full service history and you probably find this sort of car most likely at a specialist Saab dealer of which there are plenty around rather than at main dealers. So what do you have to pay to get a good one? Well you need to be paying at least three or four thousand pounds but you can pay as low as about two grand for an early L-Reg 900. And Saab owners tend to be very loyal to their cars. They will keep them for years and years and years. They're capable of huge mileages and then they'll trade in for another Saab. And of course there are some very desirable cars around. As in the 9000 range you can also get 900 Carlson special edition models and of course the convertibles are very very desirable however you'll need at least 10 grand to get yourself into a nice convertible. Although the Saab 900 isn't quite in the same league as the Germans it does have a respected image. The 900 turbo we drove is a Mark II and if you want a car that you can rack up big mileages in a 900 could be the one for you. Now the Saab 9000 has been around for just about 10 years or so now. It's been superseded by the newest model, the 95 and the 95 Estate. 
and perhaps this car is beginning to look a bit dated. If you're looking for one of these cars, things to watch out for, particularly if it's a turbocharged car or any nasty smoke coming out of the back of the engine, watch out for that. But if you check that it's got a good service history, it's had a good pedigree, it's been well looked after, you shouldn't run into too many problems. Now this 9000 is one of the top of the range executive models, but inside you should check round for any signs of wear and tear. A car that's done less than 100,000 miles or so shouldn't have any problems with seat wear or anything like that. These are very, very hard wearing seats. Plus this car has got all the goodies on. It's got electronic climate control, stereo system with a CD player, it's got heated seats, it's got the roof, it's got smart alloy wheels, leather upholstery as you can see. There's a lot of space for the rear seat passengers. Plus, like the 900 series, it's also got a good size boot. Now, there is a difference between the two models in the 9000 range. The CS model signifies that it is the five door hatchback like this, so you get that extra practicality, whereas the CD is the saloon version. The 9000 model was launched in 1991 to enable Saab to compete in that middle executive sector, a sector that they hadn't been in before. They knew that they had to compete with the likes of Mercedes and BMW and compete against the 5 Series and the E-Class, so they brought the 9000 range out. And it's been a very successful car for them. But now that it's been around for 10 years or so, that means that there are some very good bargains to be had on the used car market. A car like this with 70,000 miles, it's only three or four years old. You could pick this car up probably at a specialist dealer for somewhere around about 9,000 pounds. It's quite interesting these days that very few car manufacturers produce turbo engine cars, but Saab have remained doggedly through the 80s and the 90s still producing turbo cars and it does give you that extra boost on the motorway. You don't have to drop down a gear because the turbo cuts in and it's great for acceleration. You'll find early cars will have very little in the way of extras on, not even a sunroof and certainly not air conditioning. And it's certainly worth on an executive car like this at least having air conditioning and maybe leather seats and electric windows and all the goodies that you would want to expect. So what sort of engines do you have to choose from in the 9000 range? Well, it starts off with the base 2 litre, which only produces 130 brake horsepower and is perhaps a little underpowered for a car of this size. Better to go for either a 2.3 four-cylinder car or even better to go for something like this, the 2.3 turbo. There's also a very good 3 litre V6, which is very, very smooth. Or if you really want the high performance end, you can go for the very special edition and very limited models called the Carlson, which got more power and the extra body kit and quite a few extras. Prices of the 9000, well if you go for a 10 year old car you could pay as little as £2000 for a really good example. The 9000 had quite a long life, around 7 years on the market. Not as sporty as the 900 but with plenty of room as a family car the 9000 in 5 door form is ideal. Because they've been around for a while, early cars are very cheap. Perhaps you, like me, had never considered buying a Saab before. Well, I hope that we've shown you in the past few minutes just how good both these cars are. They're comfortable, roomy, spacious and very relaxed as a cruiser. And just remember as well that buying either of these cars gets you into that bit better quality than the normal mass-produced cars. So, which of these two would I go for? Well, if you don't need that extra space, I'd probably shy away from the 9000 and go for the 900 instead. That's it for part one. Join us again for lots more in part two. Hello and welcome back to part two of Used Car Heaven. Now coming up in this part of the programme, we pit two small to medium sized hatchbacks head to head. We've got the trusty and reliable Ford Escort against the more dashing Peugeot 306. But before all that, our car doctor Simon Hughes gets his hands dirty.
several things on a car can cost you lots of money, particularly a transmission or a clutch. The owner of this car thinks they've got a problem, so we're going to go for a test drive to find out exactly what's wrong. Now, if it is the clutch, it doesn't need to be anything too expensive. It could be something quite simple. So we're going to go for a Raz and find out exactly what's wrong. What we're listening for is any unusual characteristics. So we're driving along at a steady speed. I'm going to accelerate now and see what happens. Now, I don't know if you can hear that, but the engine is actually revving up, but the vehicle isn't accelerating as it should be doing. We'll just do it one more time. Right, well, that's stereotypical of a slipping clutch. So we're going to go back to the workshop now and investigate a little bit further. This is a clutch assembly, it's got two parts, it's two plates, and the problem with our car is the fact that when the engine's turning it, they should both be turning together. But what's happening with ours, this is slipping and that's turning on its own, and that's down to incorrect adjustment. Now it's only incorrectly adjusted because of normal wear and tear, so this is what happens. We've got the clutch cable here, and it's got an adjuster on, you can see here there isn't any play in it at all. So that's effectively as if you're driving down the road with your clutch pedal pressed down. So quite simply we can make a two minute adjustment here by holding the cable with the pliers and undoing the nut with the spanner and then with your fingers you can get on the adjusting nut, put some free play in the cable and then if you wiggle the cable around you should have some play in the arm like that and that means that the clutch assembly is then working correctly. Now when we press the clutch pedal the arm moves backwards and forwards and we can do a final check just with a test drive to make sure that everything's back to normal. Now just to give you an idea of what's entailed, all I've done here to access the job is remove the battery in the battery tray and so in total it'll take about 25-30 minutes with very simple tools indeed. So with that done it should be okay. So that seems to have been successful. I can drive along now and accelerate and with no engine revs, the car's accelerating as well as it can do for a Nissan Micra. So I'd say we've had a successful job there. So we've saved a fortune by just making a simple adjustment and it's something to look out for in the future. About three times a year somebody brings the car to me because they can't open the door from the inside, it'll only open from the outside. Well, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. If you look down here, there's a small switch which is called a child lock and basically it stops the kids from opening the doors from the inside. It only allows the door to be open from the outside for their safety. So if it's not something you're aware of, perhaps it's something that you should consider using. And our car doctor will be back at the same time next week with more top tips. But back to today's part of the programme, two cars to go head to head. First of all, we have the Ford Escort, a 1.6 Finesse, against a Peugeot 306, a 1.6 LX, and in this case, an automatic. Now, when the Escort was new, it would have cost about £12,000. The Peugeot was more expensive. This would have cost about £14,000. Now, you could buy this for six and a half and that for about seven and a half thousand. But which is the better of the two cars? We'll see. One thing for me on the Escort that you must have is power steering. If you haven't, it's going to be particularly hard work at low speeds and in parking situations. Power steering, an absolute must. Otherwise, on the car, things that go wrong, noisy camshafts, worn cam belts, the shock absorbers are probably worth a check on older cars. Uneven tyre wear on the front because these are front wheel drive cars. Apart from that, they're generally reliable. You've got a great choice of body shells to choose from three door, five door, estates, cabriolets and the booted version known as the Orion. <laughs> The Ford Escort, Britain's favourite car for over three decades. We loved them so much we bought them by the barrel load. 
and at times you begin to wonder why, to be perfectly honest. Sure, they were pretty safe and reasonably reliable and dependable, but why we love the Escort so much is a bit of a mystery. And as far as being reliable, well, the early cars, quite frankly, weren't. There were major problems and Ford had to revise them a number of times to get them anywhere close to the build quality that they should have been in the first place. But still, we continued to buy them. And these latest versions of the Escort ran from about 1990 through until 2000, when production of the Escort finally stopped. So if you're looking for a car, looking for an Escort, make sure you look for one of the later models like this, because that's where you at least get some refinement and some reliability into the cars. It's one of those strange quirks that once somebody owns an Escort, they tended to be very loyal to the Escort brand and used to stick with them. They'd progress from one Escort to the next and maybe upgrade to a slightly better model. There are loads and loads of variants in the Escort range. You start from the L and through the LX and the GLX, up through the gear and then into the high-performance hot hatchbacks like the XR3, the RS2000 and the Escort Cosworth. Lots of different engines to choose from in the Escort range. The 1.3 and the 1.4 for me are a bit underpowered and I would avoid those at all costs. Head for something like the 1.6 or the 1.8, 16 valves are better with the ZTEX even better as well. Look for something like this, this is a 26,000 mile example. This would cost at the moment around about six and a half thousand pounds. When this was new, it would have cost 12,000 pounds. So it's slumped by about 50% in less than 18 months or so. So what about the hot versions of the Escort? What should you look for there? Well, the XR3s are beginning to get a bit old and a bit dated, and finding a good XR3 is probably going to be very difficult now. You'd probably still find a very good RS2000, and they are extremely quick. But if it's speed that you're after for an Escort, head for the RS Cosworth. Lightning quick, turbocharged. When they were new, they cost nearly £30,000 which sounds a heck of a lot of money to pay for a Ford Escort. Even now, you're going to still have to pay somewhere around 16, 17, 18,000 pounds to get a really good Escort Cosworth, which to me is still a lot of money for one of those cars, but they are very, very good. So how do the Escorts actually drive? Well, not bad, not brilliant but not absolutely fantastic. In terms of how far technologically advanced the Escorts are, well, they're not, certainly not compared to the likes of the latest Focus. Ford really got it right when they produced the Focus. So these things kind of go okay. Refinement is not high on the list. Make sure you go for a car that's got plenty on it. Some of the base models tend to be very, very basic indeed, and you get things like those windy windows instead of electric versions and electric mirrors. Look out for cars with sunroofs and air conditioning. Uh, you're gonna to have to pay a little bit more, but it's worth paying that extra. To say that the Escort and the Peugeot 306 were like chalk and cheese is rather an understatement. These are two very, very different cars and attract a different sort of buyer. Things to watch out for on the 306, watch out for the front suspension, wear on that can be problematic. Again, the front tires, it's front wheel drive cars, and they tend to be driven that bit harder than the Escort. But otherwise, they're capable of very, very high mileages. Again, a good choice of cars and models and body shells to choose from three door, five door estates and cabriolet versions. What a different car to be in the 306 over the Escort. Now the Escort is okay, but you realize just how right Peugeot got things when they introduced this car and how badly things went for Ford with the Escort during the 1990s. This is such a nice cabin to be in. Everything is neat and to hand. It's well designed, it's functional, it's stylish. And as for the way that the Peugeot 306 drives, well, that is an absolute revelation compared to the Ford Escort. It sticks to the road, it goes round corners, it's very smooth, it's a very easy car to drive. It's a lot more fun and sporty than the Escort. Now, not everybody likes that, perhaps that's not what you want in a car, but for me, personally, I think it's great. And this car just adds a real zip to your driving. Most cars in the 306 range have a very good equipment level, although this 1.6 LX Automatic doesn't get air conditioning, which is quite a surprise on a car like this. This has done 21,000 miles. It's slightly older than the Escort, about two and a half years old now, 
but it's still holding its value very well. Remember when this car was new, we're talking about £14,000 and it would now sell for about £7,500. So it's lost about 50% of its value in two and a half years or so. However, having said that, it's still in good condition. Apart from the air conditioning, you get a sunroof, you get electric windows, you get an adjustable steering column too, and uh, one or two other nice little extras that you need on a car these days, but air conditioning is the biggest factor that's missing in this particular car. Other models in the Peugeot 306 range, well, they start with the base uh, XN, which can be very, very basic indeed. Not much equipment on those cars, right up to the top of the range GLX and the XSI. The 306 was first launched in 1994 and ran through until 2001 when it was replaced by the 307. Engines in the range, well, you've got 1.4, 1.6 and 2 litre petrol engines and some very good diesel engines as well if you're a big diesel fan. 1.9 diesel and turbo diesel engines and in later cars a 2 litre HDI engine. Now, fantastic fuel economy on the diesel engines as you usually get with Peugeot cars. We're talking about an average of 50 miles to the gallon. What a different car the 306 is to the Escort. The Escort is one of those okay cars, but once you get in this and you get to drive it and have a bit of fun in it, you realize just how right Peugeot got things in the 1990s when they introduced this car and how badly wrong things went at Ford with the Escort during the 90s as well. Not completely disastrous, but compared to the competition like this, things just weren't on an even keel with them. No doubt that the Peugeot 306 was the best car in its class at the time and remained so throughout the course of the 1990s. So it's decision time, which of these two cars would we go for, the Ford Escort or the Peugeot 306? Well for £6,500 the Ford Escort for me sounds a bit on the expensive side. There's no comparison compared to the Peugeot 306, this is by far the better car to drive. And I think spending out about an extra £800 to £1,000 is well worth it if you can afford it. That's it for this week's used car heaven. Next week on the programme we're driving some very classy Jaguars and a couple of Vauxhalls.